Okay, there we go. I'll try that again. I heard you, but I'd like to hear it again. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have you all with us here this morning. Uh, it is a turned out to be a beautiful day out there, kind of mild. Who expected that? But I'll take it. Yeah, exactly. Ismo's telling me she's already tired of winter, and I'm like, we've we got a ways to go. Uh, the only announcement I have is at the time, right after the sermon hymn, will be the installation of our church council uh, members and officers, as well as Lutheran men in mission uh, officers, and all the Welka leaders. Yes, and I've got that sheet right there. So, even for those who are elected and not here, their installation will be valid. So if they, if they skip today thinking that they wouldn't have to serve, wrong. We've fallen around that trick before. All right. Uh, but we're also here to worship. It is a holiday uh, today. And I know you're thinking, really? And the answer is yes, really. It's the baptism of our Lord. It is the first Sunday after Epiphany that we celebrate that. There's not really an epiphany season. The season is called uh, ordinary time after epiphany, just like we do with Pentecost. And that's when we kind of get into some of our green Sundays. And those are called, that's called ordinary time. Not because it's like blah, ordinary, just because the Sundays are numbered. The second Sunday after this, the third Sunday after that, and they go in order. And that's simply where we use the word ordinary. But here in this time after Epiphany, we start and we end with two Epiphany-like events. One is the baptism of Jesus, and then at the very end, right before Ash Wednesday starts, we, we have the transfiguration of our Lord, where we hear those same words that we hear in today's Gospel lesson, the voice of the Father saying, this is my Son, with you I am well pleased, or with Him I am well pleased. And so, it's a... It's, although the, it's not truly a church season, Epiphany, most of all the readings will serve as that, the Epiphanies, so that we discover something about Jesus. And we'll discover a couple of things today. We're also going to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. So, glad you're here. Let's prepare ourselves for worship with confession and forgiveness found on page three of your worship folder. Please stand. Hey, look, I'm not hiding behind the Advent wreath. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. You may kneel as Abel. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. 
as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our opening hymn is Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. Please rise. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you anointed Jesus at his baptism with the Holy Spirit and revealed him as your beloved Son. Keep all who are born of water and the Spirit faithful in your service, that we may rejoice to be called children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. First lesson comes from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Saba, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west, I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. In the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who's called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. We shall read the psalm responsively. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars in Lebanon. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees wither and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. O Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. The second lesson is from the third chapter of Luke. I'm sorry. <laughs> the second lesson is from the eighth chapter of Acts. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized by the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid down their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people, oh, pardon me. I'll do that again.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming is more powerful than I. And I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Did you guys see that when Pam was up here? She started trying to read the Gospel. I think somebody needs to talk to her pastor about going to seminary and becoming a pastor. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a... Pam and I were working this week on some things and just getting the website up to date with the reports kind of from last year and you know, what all kind of happened in the different committees and also working on getting the directory together which has a schedule and one of the things she submitted to me for me to kind of take a look at and kind of edit was that schedule of regularly or the list of regularly scheduled church events you know like and their times so, you know, every Sunday, worship at 10.30. Sunday school at 9.30. Chat and snack at 10. And Bible study on Tuesdays. And Bible study on Wednesdays. And the choir practices and the bell choir practices. And community lunch. You know, and it was a whole list of things and things that we haven't been able to do for over a year. And it was just kind of unusual. Just kind of unusual. It kind of found it a little bit unsettling. But I'll get more to that in a moment. I want to take a look at the gospel lesson first. You know, in the gospel of Luke, at the very beginning, we have two nativity stories. The first is the nativity of John the Baptist, a big event. Precedes the nativity of Jesus. And John the Baptist, in those first few chapters of Luke, is one of the big stars of the game. You know, he has a miraculous birth as well, born to people too old to be bearing children. But nonetheless, John the Baptist is born. And at the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, John's mother, it's John who, when he comes in, when Mary enters the room, she cries out, Greetings, John the Baptist leaps in her womb. And then, of course, <clears throat> John the Baptist is the one who burst onto the scene first. And it's hard to really overestimate the enormous popularity of John the Baptist. We read in the book of Acts that the teachings of John the Baptist stretched all the way up into what's modern-day Turkey. So he's got a huge following in the Mediterranean world. In fact, in modern-day... I guess it was... Modern-day Iran, they're followers today still of John the Baptist. It's not a very big community, 
They, don't, they tend not to have a, a high reproduction weight rate because they kind of view sexual matters, even procreation, with some kind of unusual attitudes. But, you know, this, these are like some of the people that when Al-Qaeda was storming through, you know, modern day Iran, they would find people like these to wipe out. Because they certainly weren't Muslim. They weren't Christian either, but they weren't Muslim. So they got to go. And I don't know how strong that community is, but, you know, that's the teachings of the John the Baptist has stretched 2,000 plus years. And that's pretty incredible. And John was enormously. And we see hints of that in Luke. And we see that, you know, John the Baptist is there at the river baptizing, and he's got people of all kinds coming to him. Tax collectors, oh, what should we do? Well, stop stealing so much money. Just take what you're supposed to take. And soldiers, well, what should we do? Well, yeah, okay, stop extorting people for money. Using your strength as a way to profit. Don't be corrupt. You know, so, you know, when you've got in players like the tax collectors and the military listening to what John the Baptist is saying, people start getting nervous. Now, we know the story of John the Baptist uh, who's been thrown into prison supposedly for saying something against the King Herod of the day uh, and his shifty uh, marriage to his former sister-in-law. And... You know, and then the dancing girl dances for him, and then he says, I'll give you anything. She says, and her mother says, yeah, the head of John the Baptist on the plate. That story's not even in the Gospel of Luke. Right? But the historian Josephus, who wrote extensively about the history in this part of the world during the Roman Empire, he wrote of John the Baptist, he put the suspicion out there that the real reason Herod had John the Baptist beheaded had little to do with his insulting his marriage and more to do with that John was so powerful they were concerned that he might lead a revolt. He's that popular. Yeah. And it's only, only the Jewish power structure, the Pharisees, they're not, they're not getting baptized by John. But lots and lots of people were. And it started, and it grew, and he was enormously, enormously. And our text this morning says, people start questioning, well, wait a second, maybe he's the Messiah. And poor John, a little later in Luke's Gospel, only the second time we're going to hear about him, Once today's event has passed, he twice about him. Once, John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Must not have been playing out exactly as John the Baptist thought. Because he has to have some disciples go. And this is where Jesus says, you go back and tell them this. You know, everything that's prophesied about the Messiah is coming true. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Good news is preached to the poor. So they go back and do that. But, you know, for John to even question that just kind of brings to mind, what, what was he expecting? He had made some great promises about the Messiah. He was darn certain it was Jesus. But now, you know, what's going on? Jesus confirms who he is to John through his disciples. The next time we hear about John in the Gospel of Luke is two chapters later in chapter 9. Um, when people are wondering, well, who is Jesus? Is he one of the prophets? Is he the Messiah? Is, is it John the Baptist? Uh, or, no, is it, yeah, John the Baptist, because he's dead by now. Has he come back to life? 
Churches. I don't, it can't be John the Baptist. I, I took off that guy's head. That's all we hear about the death of John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke. Nothing about dancing girls. Nothing about his arrest. Nothing. Because this is a transition point in the Gospel of Luke. We've seen John the Baptist. He's miraculous birth like Jesus. He's got... Uh, He's testifying to who Jesus is from the womb. He's preparing the way of the Lord through baptism, preaching, teaching, building an enormous following. Enormous following. But, then, and he keeps on doing it. They're wondering, John, are you the Messiah? He's like, no, it's not me. Look, I'm not even worthy to... Dust off that guy's shoes. I'm worthy to wash his feet. He's going to do greater things than me. And then Jesus comes. And he's baptized. And so it is for all intents and purposes, the beginning of Jesus' memory, ministry and the end of John the Baptist's ministry. It's at this point, kind of in, in the Gospel of John. This is where John says, okay, now he's got to increase, and I must decrease. He knows his ministry is coming to an end. And, you know, most of you have been in this congregation a good long while. You've seen ministries end here. And I learned an important lesson while I was on the internship. We had a ministry as a Wednesday night worship, supposed to be a little bit more laid back, and they had they had a group of people say, "Yeah, well, we should feed people, you know, so we can get them to come." And you know, as these things sometimes go, it's a great idea, but there's not enough people to do the execution, so it ended up for several weeks just being the same three women rush home from work come to the church, boil some hot dogs, you know, serve them up, and then we'd have a Wednesday night service. But, you know, no one else was picking up the slack, and it just got to be too much. And so they decided to end the ministry, the part of the ministry that was the meal. Now, these women who were, you know, active in making these meals, even though they were getting burnt out, they thought it was important. They took it as a great personal defeat. And any time a ministry ends, like John the Baptist, his ministry comes to an end. But it's so that Jesus might increase. So that might, Jesus might do his ministry. And so John's ministry has to step out of the way can't be done any longer. But yeah, those women were so upset that they, you know, that they, and they, they felt like failures. And I'm telling you, there's absolutely no need for that. Ministries are like Christians themselves. They come and they go. It doesn't mean that they were a bad thing, that they should have never been attempted or anything like that. Some, sometimes something good has to go away so that something better can be done. Which leads me to the beginning. I don't know which of these ministries that we had written down, that we've done, we've done for several years. You know, I don't know which ones are going to come back and which ones aren't. And at first, the first thought is you think, well, if a ministry wouldn't come back, it must have been a failure. And no. No. I don't know what Bible study will look like. I don't know what we'll do for our community if we decide not to have a community lunch again. 
these are all decisions to be made. And I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. God hasn't spoken to me and saying these ones are going to return, these ones aren't. But sometimes ministries have to go away. You know, better, rather than focus on what we have done, we put the focus to where the ministry in the present is going to be. That God's still going to work through this congregation. It might look differently, but we've been, we've been given the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's what our prayer today said, prayer of the day. Keep all who are born of, born of water and the Spirit. Keep all of us faithful in your service. It doesn't say what that service is. Lots of ways to serve God. And that we may rejoice to be called children of God. Not that we can sorrow over what we used to do, but we can always rejoice that we are children of God regardless of what we're able to do, Regardless of if we're doing now something different than we've done before, we're called here to minister. And it will look different in the future than it looked in the past. That much we know. But as long as we're faithful, as long as what we do is proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, then we're doing the will of God. That's at the root all ministry. Amen. All right, our next hymn is Crashing Waters at Creation. Please rise. Seated. At this time, I invite those elected to office in Lutheran Men and Mission, be Charles Nicholson, Frank Yance, Bill All, to come forward. I'd like those leaders of the Welka to come forward. President Linda Griffith, Vice President and Cameron Circle Leader Isma Bolin, Treasurer Ann Satterwhite, Lydia Circle, Carolyn Rozuski, and Beverly Nivens. Rebecca Circle, Lolita Kitt, and Linda Hill. I also invite those uh, on council, either elected positions or appointed, to come forward, uh, namely Rebecca Fingerlin as president, Charles Nicholson as vice president, Meredith Cleland as treasurer, and we're still looking for a church secretary. Now's your chance to volunteer. Just jump up. Nope. Okay, also all council members, please. Would you be Beth Cleland, David Griffith, Elizabeth Sheely, Beverly Nevins? Um, who else? Hmm? Bill? That's right, okay. Did I miss someone? I don't know. 
Okay, we're a little we're a little heavy on this side. Come, some of you guys move over this way. <clears throat> In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated each of you from sin and death and made you members of His church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. And I ask you, together with all those who are gathered here, I invite the rest of you to stand, please. I ask you, with all who are gathered here, to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we are baptized, with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated. St. Paul writes, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them all. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform different service, but the same God who gives everyone ability for particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. You have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect him in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and that God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving, that the one Lord who empowers us is glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain the life and harmony of this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, are you ready to accept and faithfully to carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, respond, yes, by the help of God. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leadership, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If so, respond, yes, by the help of God. <clears throat> I now declare you installed as officers and council members in this congregation. God bless you with his Holy Spirit that you may prove faithful servants of God. Let the people of God say amen. You may return to your seats. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. You may kneel as able. By the Holy Spirit, you gather your church and send it out in mission to share the good news of Jesus. Inspire your faithful people to be fervent in prayer and service that all people know that they are precious in God's sight. God of grace, you reveal your love and power through water and the Spirit. Guard rivers, seas, and all bodies of water from destruction and pollution. Secure access to clean water for all and protect the land from drought and flood. God of grace, establish among the nations the blessings of peace. Raise up leaders who will protect the vulnerable people in their care. Strengthen advocates who risk reputation or retaliation for the sake of mercy and justice. God of grace, you protect us through the fires and troubled waters of this life. 
Assure us that we will not be cut off from you by illness or despair, anxiety or pain, confusion or weakness. Comfort all who are in need, especially those on our prayer list and those we now name aloud and in our hearts. God of grace, we are joined in baptism to Christ and to, to one another. Bless those who are newly baptized and those who are preparing for baptism. Help us to be faithful in fellowship, worship, evangelism, service, and justice seeking. God of grace, you created each of your saints for your glory. We give thanks for those you have called by name into, the, into your eternal embrace. Comfort us in grief and release us from fear. God of grace, since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all, all of our prayers to you, confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share God's peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding, that by holding the God made visible, we may be drawn to the God whom we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in this Holy Supper. In the night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Come to the table where Christ meets you. Eat, rejoice, and be glad.
Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. together. God of wonder, in Jesus we behold the light of the world come near. As you have come among us now, send us out in joy, hastening to share the good news of your love. We ask this in the name of Jesus, through the Spirit, dwelling among us now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our final hymn, Abide, O Dearest Jesus. Peace to love and serve the Lord.